Hello everyone, this is the great Lord and Master Osaron the Eternal for what's going to be Osaron Tarot Spiral 10. But I'm taking this back to the beginning, and this video is going to take the place of Osaron Tarot Spiral 1, the proto version, because I'm going to get into a couple key aspects here. One is going to be a basic overview of what the Osaron Tarot Spiral is. And, but the main thing I'm going to do here is cover how the uh, tarot keys interact with the zodiac in a pictorial sense. And uh, you see here, this is the Osiron Tarot Spiral with the proper planetary ring, which I cover in part 8, the planetary deacon deception, and part 7. But this uh, shows how and why this is the proper uh, planetary sequence for the deacons. And, uh, and this uses, the Osiron Tarot Spiral uses the entire tarot, okay? It uses the tarot trumps, which you see here going around the spiral. It uses the court cards, which show up here on the axis of the Great Lord, or the planetary axis. And the court cards show, show that the court cards are actually one of the most powerful aspects of the tarot. It's uh it really does. It, it covers a lot in this. It, it covers the uh, precession of the equinox, but it also shows atomic structure, which I get into in part nine. Really, really powerful. And in um, the court cards and how they relate to the uh, precession, I cover in parts four and five. The spear and de the spear of destiny. In part five is like a uh, the historical timeline of events and how it relates to what I show in the spear of destiny. And um, down here is the pips. This is the order of the pips with the Osiron Tarot Spiral. The pips use a sequence of 0 through 9 in, as opposed to 1 through 10. And the aces take the place of 0. And the planetary order below these numbers is the secondary planetary aspect, which is fixed. And that uses the days of the week. But this planetary ring is the, uh, the main one. And it starts in the axis of the Great Lord, goes around and ends here. I explain that in those videos. But now to get to the main presentation, which is going to be how the uh, tarot keys, the tarot trumps, relate to the zodiac. Because make no mistake, the tarot is first and foremost a pictorial representation of the zodiac before anything else. There's people in occult circles who, who like to think that the, uh, that the tarot is a is a symbolic of the tree of life and it, it does work with the tree of life but it's not primary the, the tarot is primarily a zodiac transmission as I'll show you um, and it also shows up in the zodiac wheel because if you take the houses there's 12 houses in the zodiac 1 through 12 if you add up all those numbers 1 through 12 stacking each number as you go the total comes to 78 which is a powerful link to the the, you know, because the, the tarot cards are 78 cards in total. So when you add up the houses, you get the 78. Okay, now, in the dead center of this is where the fool goes. And this shows the power of the fool, because everything emanates from that zero space of the fool. The entire zodiac emanates from that. And then, the, the procession or the spiral begins at the conception of the year. Because if you recall, the year has actually two beginnings. The year is conceived at the winter solstice, but it's actually born at the spring equinox. And the winter months are the womb months. That's the gestation period for the year. See, the, uh, the way the trumps interact with the zodiac is actually um, shows the life of a man, of a human being, from conception to death. And we're seeing that here. This is the zero. The card number one is the high priestess. And as one, you know, there's people who, who may not like that idea. But the, you have to recall when the zodiac, uh, when the tarot was first discovered, the cards weren't numbered, and it was discovered in the 14th century. So back then, if you had tried to say that card number one was a, a female card or the high priestess, you you would have been burned at the stake. You probably had your family slaughtered along with you. So they could not do that. They had to put the magician as one and the high priestess as two, but that's simply not the case. 
as I've shown in countless videos, the feminine precedes the masculine, and it does so here too in the earth sign of Capricorn, and it's the high priestess. Card number two is the magician, and that is the masculine aspect of creation, electricity, duality. This is the action aspect, and this is why it's the magician. Card number three is the empress, and what the empress does is give birth to the emperor. Okay, they're not uh, husband and wife. The empress and the emperor aren't husband and wife. The empress is the mother of her child, which is the emperor. Okay, and that takes us to the birth of the year at the equinox. And the first card above the abyss is um, the emperor. And also I want to add, I forgot to add, this also follows cube geometry. This follows the tarot cube geometry. The zero is the center point of the fool. These three womb cards are the, axi the axes of the cube. These six upper cards above the abyss are the faces of the cube. And the double row on the outside in blue are the outer edges of the cube. So this follows cube geometry. This is how you get the tarot spiral. But then when you break into the uh, above the abyss, we, we see the emperor. Now the emperor is usually shown as an old man in a chair, and he's a wise emperor, but that's not the case. The emperor is actually a baby. The emperor is born here, and the emperor is a baby. And, so, and that's what he is, he's a baby. And we know that because uh, the emperor is a masculine figure, but he's born into a house that is ruled by a queen, okay, and that's feminine. And, the, and what that's saying is the emperor is still a baby, he's prepubescent, he's still a child, he's not a man yet. And this is why he's a baby here. And he's born, he's a baby, he's not a man yet. Now, the next card is the Arafant. That This would go here. Now, the Arafant is a card that I've had a lot of issue with. And that is another card that if you had drawn it properly, you would have gotten burned at the stake. Uh, the original card, or, or older tarot cards, call it the Pope. And, uh, but the Arafant is actually drawn incorrectly. Now, in the Karubic, in the Zodiac, the Karubic positions are androgyne positions, okay? That means they're both feminine and masculine. And this is, this house is ruled by Earth, and this is ruled by water. So these two houses, even though they're androgyne, they're going to be dominantly feminine. So if you were to draw them, they should be a, a female image over the, over the masculine. So the Arafant is drawn as an old pope, a wise church guy. But really, this should be a female character, perhaps instructing her child. There's a lot you could do with this. I'm still working on this. But you got to keep in mind, the house is uh, an earth sign, ruled by Taurus, uh, ruled by Venus, it's Taurus. The, pri the, uh, the planetary ruler of it in the Karubic position is Venus. This is actually ruled by Venus twice because the secondary, the fixed aspect is also ruled by Venus. So you have two Venus rules here uh, in the Karubic position. It's ruled by Venus. It's the Earth sign, which is feminine. So this is all feminine. And you'll also notice that in the planetary ring, I have them uh, switching from uh, red to blue. That's showing the uh, gender dominance via the uh, elements of each, each one. This is fire, so it's masculine. This is earth, so it's feminine. This is air, so it's masculine, and so on and so forth. That's how it goes. Now, one of the next cards, one of the most amazing positions of this uh, Osteron Tower Spiral is card six, the lovers. And that lands here in this house. Now, most cards show this as a young couple in love. But one of the oldest tarot cards show it as a man and there's two women with him. And some people say he has to make a choice between women, but that's not what that is. The two women, one of those women is the emperor's mother, and the other card is his lover. So what's happening is the mother is now passing off her son who is going through puberty and becoming a man. The, the mother is passing off her son to the other woman in his life, which is going to be his queen. So that's what the lovers mean. So the lovers is symbolic of sexual maturity. 
and the number of the car of the lovers is six, which is sexuality, or uh, exertive sexuality. So that's what the, uh, the, the uh, lovers is. It's the mother passing off her son, the emperor, to his new woman, his new queen, which is his lover. That's why it's called the lovers. And that's that. Now, in that this is showing the stages of the the, babe, the uh, emperor's life, the man's life. He's born here, he's an infant. Here he's an adolescent, still prepubescent. Here he's going through puberty. He, he's becoming awakened sexually, but he's not matured yet. He's just starting that process. Now at the top of the zodiac, which is the height of summer, or the, uh, 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 the uh, solstice, is now when the emperor is a man. In this next season, the uh, summertime, is when the emperor acts with his fullest power as a man. And then the next card we see here is the chariot. The chariot, as I've said before, represents the blood of the body. And what that means is the body is sexually alive now. See, the emperor is fully alive sexually. He's in his most powerful position. He's in charge of his own sexual energy. And that, that's what's being said by the chariot. And then the next card, we're at the top of the axis. Now, this is the strongest point. These two months are the strongest uh, seasons of the year. And the next, this is card eight. Now, this is another Karubic uh, house. In eight, the strength card in the weight deck, this is a good example, but the strength card is shown by a, a woman, an angelic woman, who is um, controlling, taming a lion. And this is pretty good imagery because it's Karubic, so the feminine aspect is dominant, as it always is. And the lion represents the masculine forth, force. And so the feminine aspect is, is controlling the powers of the material world, which is represented as the masculine force of the lion. You could even equate that to Sophia properly controlling her creation, uh, Yaldabaoth. It's a, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but uh, the uh, Demiurge. So Sophia is properly controlling the, the uh, Demiurge in the proper way here. The Demiurge didn't lose control and, take, and you know, become Abrahamism in the perverse world we see today. Well, that's what we're seeing here. Now, the Hermit falls into House 9. And this is the final uh, phase of the summer. This is, the, this is where the emperor is, um, his powers are waning and he's getting ready to hand over the reins of his rule to other people. This is the final uh, aspect of his, of his um, controlling life where, his power, where he's actually taking charge of things. Okay? He's getting ready to go below the abyss. And this is what we see with the hermit in House 9. Now, we go below the abyss with the next two cards, we also jump out of the face of the cube into the outer rows of uh, the cube. And the first card we see here is 10, okay? And that's the Wheel of Fortune. And all that's really saying is that the wheels, the wheels of fate and destiny continually turn and there's no escaping that. You know, the Emperor now has crossed into a place where he's not He's getting prepared for his death. This is a time for introspection. This is a time for he's making peace with himself. He's going to discover who he really is. And uh, the reins of power, he may still be the king, but the actual duties of the realm are handled by other people now. He's handed off that to other people. He's focusing now on making peace with who he is as a being. And we see that with the ten. And this is confirmed by the next card, Justice Eleven. Now, the, the card 11 is two ones, so what that's, what that's suggesting is he's actually seeing who he really is. He's facing himself in the uh, uh, introspective mirrors of who he is. He's analyzing who, is, who he is, who his life was, what his purpose and mission here in, in life is, and this is what is showing with 11. Now, there's a lot going on with Libra as far as the scales of Libra and balance. And I get into that in part three, uh, Message of the Blood, and there's a lot with that, but I'm not going to cover that now, but there's a lot that goes with that. 
Now, the next card is one of the key parts of the uh, Osron Tarot Spiral, and one of the most fitting cards to land anywhere on this spiral is the Hanged Man, which is Atu-12. That lands in Karubic Water, and uh, that's, I couldn't think of a more fitting spot for that to land. And, it, and what that's saying is, the Emperor is getting ready to die. He knows he's going to die, but he's also illumined completely now. He understands the meaning of life. He understands why he was here. He understands the purpose of what he was doing here and what it all means, okay? He's illumined, but he's going to die. And now, the next card, Death, is the Death. People say the Death card is only a uh, symbolic metaphor for other things. Well, it's really not. The Death card is the death card. The emperor dies here. The, Demper, the emperor dies here and he's dead. Now this brings us to one of the most amazing houses in the Osiron Tarot Spiral, and that is House 9, Sagittarius. There's a lot going on with this. Sagittarius is actually the alleyway between the non-physical and the physical. Okay, and it's a two-stage operation. See, temperance, card 14 is temperance, and that card is saying that the physical body, the ego and everything that goes along with the identity of who the emperor was, is dissolving back into zero. The one of the ten, the one is becoming zero again. Well, this is what is happening here. The one that was the emperor, the ego identity of the emperor, is becoming zero again. And this is shown by temperance. Now let me show you a picture of temperance in the weight deck. What we see here, this is temperance, okay? And what you'll see is an angelic figure with one foot on land, one in the water. You're also going to see the sun is setting in the west. That's symbolic of death. But now the cups, the angelic being is pouring a cup from the land side into the water side. That is again suggesting that the physical body and the ego identity of the individual that was the emperor is becoming zero again. This is what we see here. Okay. Now, the next card, this is going to cause people to jump up and down and, and stomp their feet, but the devil actually goes here in Sagittarius, and what that is, is the sexual aspect of rebirth. This, is, this represents the sexuality of duality of this sexed universe, and this is what this is, the devil, and it actually belongs in Sagittarius. Now, the people, now wait, uh, wait, on the weight deck, they knew this, or at least it's either a huge coincidence, but this is the devil card in the weight deck, okay? You're going to notice that the devil is there, and the devil is holding a torch, and that is pointing downward. And what that represents is the only fire sign below the abyss is that, the fire sign, that Sagittarius. It's telling you that is where this card belongs. And then the two chained people, the, the two chained humanoid figures, the man has a tail of fire, which represents Sagittarius, and the female, the woman, has a tail with grapes on it, which represents the Earth of Capricorn. So it's telling you that this belongs there. And here's the Crowley version of the devil. Okay, It's a giant phallus. You can see the two balls and then the shaft of the phallus. Now this does have the goat on it for Saturn or Capricorn in the rings of Saturn, but it, it definitely does not belong there. Absolutely not. See, now these two cards, Temperance and uh, the Devil, are cards 14 and 15. Now when you reduce those, it becomes a 5 and a 6, which is the heart of the true tree and the heart of the jewel. And this is the heart of the true tree. This is going back to zero. And the, and the true tree is the emanation from zero into the physical. And the, uh, the Devil, or in the 6, is the heart of the jewel of creation, which is what the Kabbalistic tree that's presented in Kabbalistic circles really is, is the six. That's why it's got the heart of the six. And then what happens, now the next card is a powerful confirmation of this truth, okay? The next card is the tower. And what the tower is, you know, the, what the tower actually is, is an ejaculating phallus. That's what the tower is. Now the phallus of the devil, the sexual aspect of the devil, his phallus is impregnating the high priestess 
And the ejaculation of that interaction is what the tower represents. The devil ejaculates into the waters of the high priestess, and this is what this card symbolizes. And then the very next card is symbolic of the conception, the new life is being conceived again with the star. This is what that means. But in this stage of the game, the, uh, the, the body hasn't been ensouled yet. And this is a pretty big topic. But the, the, the child has been conceived, and that, that's what the star means, but there has, there's no ensoulment yet. The soul hasn't bonded with the body yet. And, uh, in, in, uh, actually, my last video, I talk about stargates and all that stuff. And this is why the, it's so important for us in this, in this physical world to maintain our bodies and breed properly with other people and make sure our, our bloodline stays pure and strong because the soul needs good stock to ensoul into. So if, we, if, if, we're having, if we're producing kids who are just freaks and you know, all depraved and stuff like that, the soul isn't going to have a good choice of bodies to go into. So our task on this side of the fence in the physical world is to make sure that the souls have good bodies, good, strong, healthy bodies through proper genetics to ensoul into. And this is what the star means. The star is the fetus that was conceived, but it's not ensouled. Now, these cards that, these next outer layer of the cards sort of show, these first cards are the axis cards, and these secondary outer cards are augmentations of what's going on with these initial axis cards. So they work hand in hand, they go together. As we see here, we've got the High Priestess here, and this is the action that's happening in the High Priestess. The devil ejaculates into her, and then she conceives with the child. Same thing with the Emperor. Now, this is one of the most amazing positions in the uh, entire Osiris Tower Spiral. you got the, uh, the, the uh, Magician, the Magus. I had just said Emperor, but it's not. It's the uh, Magician. The Magician goes here. And his tools of creation is the feminine aspect of the moon and the masculine aspect with the sun. Okay, now you're going to see something very amazing here. Uh, in this house, Aquarius, its corresponding opposition house is Leo, and the planetary deacon assignments that go along with Leo are Mercury, the Moon, and the Sun. And we're seeing that here. The magician is associated with Mercury, okay, and then we see the Moon and the Sun following it. So the planetary aspect is here, Mercury, Moon, Sun, and we're seeing that in the house below that, which is Mercury, and then the Moon and the Sun. And those are the tools of creation. Uh, and then the final house of Pisces is, you have, again, this is the Empress, but then you have Judgment, which represents the masculine aspect of activity. You know, this is the life is about to be born, and this is any living being is a masculine thing. So this isn't about men and women specifically because any life that exists in the dual uh, realm of the matrix, because it's alive, it's masculine. It doesn't matter what gender you are physically. Everybody's masculine here because we're alive. And this is what this represents. You're alive, everything is good, and then 21, the world, means you're being born into the world again. Right? And then when you add these, all these numbers and you reduce just these two, you get two, three, four, and five. So this is like the pentagram. This is telling you the pentagram is being born again into the world again and it starts all over again. So this is how that goes. Now, here, when it, when it comes to the Karubics in the gender assignments with each of, the, each of them, the dominant uh, gender is going to be determined by the element of the house. So here, what is labeled the Arafat as a man is actually f dominantly female, as I went on to say, and the other one here is water, and that's going to be that too. Now, up here, the figure, again, it's Karubic, but the figure of importance is both of them, but this is a masculine representation because of the eight. But the eight is just made up of two elements of uh, the four female elements and then the four masculine elements. And we see that with the card again. There's the woman, angelic woman, which represents Kundalini, the divine power. And the lion is the active masculine force or the material matrix. 
material matrix electricity being controlled by Kundalini. Now here is a different story because this is actually two distinct sections. This is the uh, axis, the axis cards, and this is the outer card. So these stay separated in the relation because when you add these numbers up, it, it would total to three, and that is obviously feminine, congruent with the masculine association of air. But these stay separate. So the uh, magician is two, and then cards 19, uh, 18 and 19 reduce to a one. Okay? So what that's telling you is the magician is using the power of the high priestess, which ultimately is Kundalini, the divine feminine force of beauty and truth. The magician is using that power, which is shown by these cards reducing to a one, using the power of Kundalini to operate in the world. That's what this is saying. So we're seeing the two-one presentation. So the magician is the two, and his tool that he's working with is the power of Kundalini, which is nothing more than the high priestess and the one. Very powerful stuff. Um, now, one thing I want to get to is the Osron Tarot Spiral also has a code that's produced with it, okay? And I explain that more in parts two and three in greater detail of what that code is. But the code is, uh, it's actually, the code is 136, 163, 199, then 136, 163, 199, and it ends with 136, okay? And we're seeing what happens here. Now, one of the cool parts about that is, the secondary number, like you see a 1, 3, and a 6 here, well that 6 is cancelled out by its opposing number. So we got 1 and 3, and then the 6 is turned off because it's cancelled out with its 3 to produce a 9. And then the next one is 1, 6, 3, but the 3 is cancelled out by the 6 to produce a 9. So the operating aspect is 1 and 3, and then the next one is 1 and 6. Well, 13 is death, and the 16 is the tower. Okay. Now, when you add 1 and 3, that gives you 4, and when you add 1 and 6 here, that gives you 7, and then when you add 7 and 4, that gives you 11, which reduces to a 2, and that is that. Now, in part 3 of the Message of the Blood, I actually started to allude to this, but I lost my train of thought and I just abandoned it. But this code that's generated by the Osiron Tarot Spiral actually has 13 steps. And we see here on the... Uh, um, solstice axis, the bottom becomes a 9, and I explain that in part 3, part 2 and 3, and the top here reduces to a 4. And when you add 9 and 4, that becomes 13, okay, and we're seeing the 13 steps of creation. Now what happens is, you've got the 1, the 3, the 6, and that turning into 9 is 1, 2, 3, 4. The fifth step is the 4, okay, and then you got uh, 6, 7, 8 and 9, and the 10th step is a 7, when you add these it becomes 11, right? And then when 2 adds to 3 it becomes 5, which is the 12th, and then when the 2 adds to 6 it becomes 8, which is the 13th steps. And that's showing the machinations of the true tree of life. So what really happens on the tree of life, you could say, is the Kundalini pillar is ever per pervasive and dominant, that's why it's over here, and the 3 plus 1 gives you 4, 6 plus 1 gives you 7, and then this is the body. The body is here. The, the, this, the uh, 4 represents the elements, which is the body, and the 7 represents the blood, which is the blood of the body. This is now ready for ensoulment, and then when you add these up, it becomes 2. And then the life is here. Then the 2, uh, the uh, life force using Kundalini becomes 5. Uh, and 2 plus 6 becomes 8, so showing the whole uh, series of numbers uh, of, of the uh, number code with the machinations of the code that's revealed from the Osiron Tarot Spiral. See, all this links together. And one point I want to mention too that's really important is uh, when you add both houses, these tarot numbers, these tarot numbers, and then these two, the total for all the numbers becomes 88. And when you put the Jewel of Creation back on the true tree to produce the tree of the Great Lord, which I have videos about. These two, how these two sephirot become an eight and an eight, which is eight and eight, and that produces sixteen. Well, it's saying that here as well. So this becomes uh, sixteen, 
in the Acts of the Great Lord, which is what this is, I explain how that is derived in other videos, but real quickly what happens is, these two tarot cards form a three, it goes around, these two tarot cards become six via fifteen, and then when it goes around here, these four tarot cards become seven, and the reduced totals add up to sixteen, again, which is a tower, so this is like a giant phallus again. So this is how the Axis of the Great Lord is derived, but it's not just a tarot that does that, because the Axis of the Great Lord is also a planetary mirror, so the zodiac shows the axis of the Great Lord and the tarot, and they both confirm each other as that goes. So um, that should be it, I think. This is this is actually being done on a, another blue moon. This is the second blue full moon of 2018, and it's only March. So we had a blue moon in January, which is two full moons. February, fe February there was no moon. In March, we had, again, two full moons. And today is a full moon. It's a big day as far as that goes. There's a lot going on today. It's Saturday. It's a full moon, a blue moon. It's also the first day of Passover, which is a you know big Jewish holiday. And it's also Saturday, which is you know the God of the Jews, basically. Or you know, they worship Saturn in its perverse form, I have to add. It, they worship Saturn as a male god, but as we know, Saturn is primarily, dominantly feminine with a masculine aspect as I've explained in other videos. So this is it. This is the Oseron Tarot Sparrow, the Lost Keys of the Zodiac. And thank you for watching, and Namaste.